All right. Good evening, everybody. We're going to go ahead and we're going to get started tonight. Um, we're going to be going over the control of land use this evening. Uh, so we have a lot of material that we got to cover tonight, uh, but we're going to try to move relatively quickly uh, to get through this content so that everybody can get a break and go home and, and relax and, and recoup uh, and go from there. So tonight, we're like I said, we're going to be jumping into uh, into unit number 16. Um, our session, our, our, our meeting tonight, we could say, is going to be uh, identifying the various types of public and private land use controls, as well as subdivision regulations. We're also going to distinguish uh, between the function and characteristics of building codes and zoning ordinances. Okay. We'll further describe the environmental issues as an agent must understand to protect his client's interest. Uh, so things like basic hazards, uh, discovery methods, disclosure responsibilities, liability issues. Uh, and we're also going to explain the major real estate industry green initiatives. Uh, we'll further discuss and explain their goals for reducing the overall impact on human health and the environment. So again, there are many times in these situations uh, that you're going to end up having different types of controls on land. Okay. Uh, so public controls, of course, there are different factors that come into play, uh, but this gives you the comprehensive plan. And it basically, in these types of plan, it expresses the community goals. It designates the areas for residential, commercial, and industrial development, which is oftentimes kind of like zoning, okay, zoning and planning. Uh, further, it indicates the location of community facilities and utilities, as well as the proposals for the transportation, uh, the recommendations for procedures for the historic uh, preservation, as well as downtown renewals, flood control, and environmental concerns. And lastly, of course, it lists the actions to carry out the plan. So again, the comprehensive plan, the goal of the comprehensive plan is to indicate or to create a method uh, in which we have this open layout. Uh, we have this land that is classified as our city. Uh, how are we going to break things down? Okay. So as you understand, things do change. So Mr. Eugene, let me ask you this question. When you were a little boy, when you were in Navasota, does Navasota still look exactly the same as it did as it is today from when you were a little boy? No. You mean things changed? Well, I, I know that the commercial buildings, all those are in the same spot and all the houses are in the same spot, right? No, no, no. What about you, Miss Linda? Everything, I know you were further in the rule, everything's exactly the same, correct, when you were a little girl? Nope. No, what happened? The, there's people that are moving in, building homes and all, and it used to not be like that. It used to be wooded area, et cetera. So in that situation is, even Stephan, you're a younger gentleman compared to, uh, to us in here. Does things look exactly the same as when you were a little boy? Yeah. Here in Bryan College Station? No, 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 no. Not at all. So as you see, what happens? Things change. We progress. I remember when I was a little boy, the, the, the commercial stuff was all in the city itself. They didn't go to the highway, it was around the city itself. Well, then what happened? The city ended up, the, the, they wanted it to be on the road on the main highway because of what? You get people to pull off and stop at your, your location, okay? It's just like if you drive downtown in Houston, Bryan, or wherever, you'll notice a lot of those areas are abandoned, okay? Uh, my mom and I were driving through town the other day, and I said, what was this place? She said, oh, it's the old Chevy dealership. And I was like, in downtown Bryan? And she's like, yeah, that was the old Chevy dealership. So in that situation, like I tell everybody, is, is to, that you have to understand that there are going to be this changing that always occurs. Okay. So... In regards to these controls, like we said earlier, coming back real quick, 
If you look at number bullet two there, talk about designated areas of residential, commercial, and industrial. If you go to number two, it shows you this is what we use is the zoning. Okay. Like we talked about the other night when we we're talking about appraisals. If Mr. Eugene, like I said, is if Aiden moves next door to you at your house and he opens up a pig farm, what happens to the value of your house? Why does it drop? Plummets. Why does it plummet? Because it's got a pig farm there and nobody wants to live next door. Exactly. So in that situation is we have to have zoning that allows what? It allows for, for Mr. Eugene not to worry that Aiden's going to buy and move right next door and have a pig farm next to it. Okay. Look so, at all that bacon you have. I know yeah. he got all that free bacon and he didn't want it. Free bacon and ribs. Yeah. That's right. And he just he didn't want it. And Man, Mr. Eugene, look at all that you're missing out on. And okay. those pig feet. And pig feet too. Don't forget about the smell. <laughs> Don't forget about the smell. Right, that's what's going to run me off. <laughs> what what happens if Cody he starts his business and he wants to build a skyscraper right next to your house? Is that okay? Why, why don't I mean Cody? You should be proud of Cody's he might block the sun from my house, huh? He might block the sun. Yeah, he may block your views. Okay, so in that situation, is we use zoning in order to do what? In order to go in and create this situation of protection. Okay, where you don't have to worry, Mr. Eugene, about is Stephen or I mean, is Aiden going to move, move a pig farm or is Cody going to put a skyscraper? You know that the person next door is going to use it for what? Residential use. Okay. So in this situation, police power is utilized to regulate the use of private land, and it prevents in or basically it creates in some situations. Thanks. Let her rip. Uh, yeah, let her rip. It's all stepping, by the way. So everything that goes wrong is all stepping. I'm just gonna let y'all know. Oh, um, but in that situation is, is that it prevents any type of incapa or incapacit incompatible, sorry, incompatible adjacent use. And what that means is this: we do not want, for example, for Keith and to go over and enjoy his property and Garrett comes over and starts a dairy farm. We don't want, you know, a person starting a business next door to us. We want to have our privacy. Okay? We want to have our right to enjoy it. We also, with these police powers, we restrict the height and size of buildings. It also provides setbacks. Mr. Grossman, what was the point of the setback? Why do we need a setback? Uh, to give room for power lines. <laughs> Well, well, what happens if Mr. Mr. Cody and, and Mr. Garrett, their houses are, they have a two foot distance between their two houses. And Mr. Aiden's, uh, Aiden's has behind both of those houses, he has a, a shed that caught on fire. Do we need access for, for people to get back there to that fire? Yeah. yeah. So sometimes what do we want to do? We want our setbacks for what to get back there. Say, well, maybe a fire truck. Fire yeah. So in that situation, there sometimes are going to be setbacks for things like that. It also controls the density, and also it just promotes the basically the value or the views, the the worth of the property, make it look nice. Okay. And it also enforced through requirements of building permits. So, for example, with permits. Mr. Aiden, can you end up in a situation, for example, could you go uh, go to, say Mr. Eugene calls you and says, hey, Aiden, come over to my house and I want you to build a shed for me. Can you just go over to this house and build a shed? Yeah. Why not? Uh, you have to be permitted by the city. Well, sure. do you have any problems, Mr. Eugene? I mean, it's your property. Yeah, I don't have problems in build. I don't need no permit. Yeah, you don't need no permit. I don't need no stinking permit. So, Stephen, what if he doesn't go get a permit? I don't think he's going to get in trouble, can he? Well, what can they do, Miss Linda, if Mr. Eugene has Aiden come over and build a shed? They can have, have it torn down. You mean they can tell Mr. Eugene that he's got to tear, tear down his shed that he's bought and he paid for? They're going to tell him he's got to tear his shed down? If it's in the encroachment line? 
or on that approach to plant. Mr. Eugene, you'll be happy about that? <laughs> you all say Cody after, right? right. Call Cody. Call Cody. Yeah. Cody, take care of it. Oh. No, what happens is, is, yeah, if you don't have a building permit and you build a structure, and trust me, clients do this, okay? Clients do this all the time. They'll go over and they will build a structure without having a permit. And guess what happens? Yeah, Does the city always catch it? No. No, the city don't catch it. When do they catch it, though, Stephen? When you're selling the property. When you're selling the property, they're going to say, I need to see your survey. And then on that survey, it's going to have what? The building. It's going to show that building. And it's not going to be, it's not going to show that shed. There's a shed there. And they're going to say, new survey required. So new survey has to be required. Now it's going to show that shed that's an encroaching. So what happens? You have to tear it down. Tear it down. And if you tear down a structure, what happens to the value of the property? It goes down. You mean removing a trailer house off of it doesn't just keep the price where it's at? No, it does not. I didn't know that, by the way. That's something new here. Sure. So, but in that situation is, is that in some situations, yes, they, you, if you tear down a building, it's going to devalue that property. Okay. Now, there also are going to be different uses of classifications. Now, Miss Linda, question for you. What's a single family residential home? Single family residential home. Single family. One family. How many? One. Do you agree with that, Abel? One family? I think I'm going to have to, yeah. I agree. Are you sure? Single family, like 95% sure. 95% sure. Stephen, you know, this this word single means 50, right? One family. One family. Miss Thomas, you're right. No yeah. means more than one. Single family means it is one. Now, let me ask you this question. Miss Nobles, what if Stephen has a 10,000 square foot home? Can he have more than one family in that house? Depending on where you're living. <laughs> but could you? I mean, that's a huge could house, you man. could you move your mom and dad and sister and everybody into the house? I wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to, but could you? Yeah. Yeah. Probably. But is it still classified as a single family or multifamily? No, it's still single. Because it's still one structure. That's why I'm getting it off here. Okay. A single family house is built for a single family. Aiden could end up renting a two-story bedroom house, and his family could end up sleeping in a bedroom. If it's him, his wife, and one child, they could accompany one bedroom of one house. Yeah. Cody could live in another bedroom with his family, Stephen in another, and me in another. But it's still, the structure itself was meant for what, Aiden? One family. Okay. Now, what then is a multifamily? It's not what I just said. A multifamily is this. It is a duplex or a fourplex. It actually has exterior doors from the outside for each unit, but it's in one structure. Does that make sense? So for you to determine what type of unit it is, what do you look for? The doors itself. How many exterior doors are there? Now, yeah, you may say, well, there's a single family and it's got a front and back door. So that means it's two. No, that's one. How many doors actually come out? And most of the time on four places, they'll have two of each. So how many doors are you actually going to have? There's four. Two is a total eight doors. But it's still a fourplex. So it makes sense. Okay. So again, when we're dealing with classifications, you have your residential, your commercial, industrial, agricultural, and your planning unit development. Now, of course, these buffer zones are going to be transitions between them. So, for example, Miss Linda, do you, will you ever see, if it's properly zoned, will you ever see a residence, a single-family residence, 
but next to an industrial park. Yeah. Why not? Because the industrial park, it's like sort of like business. Yeah, I mean, how many of you went to end up? I remember when I was little, there was an industrial place, a machine shop, and I was in, my parents, we lived in a trailer park, a little while down, but what did we hear all the time? Bang, 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 all the time. That's all you heard. Well, the thing is in that situation is, that's an industrial park next to a resident. People have learned those don't go together, okay? So we use these buffer zones well, what will happen is, is we'll take a single family neighborhood and next to that single family, we may put a residential multifamily, quote unquote, apartment complex. And then guess what we put next to the apartment complex? An office building. And then after the office building, then what we might put? Put an industrial park. And then after that, what do we put next? Agriculture. Well, agriculture. You'll see how this works. Now, Aiden, is every single city set up like this? No. no. You ever been to Houston? Yep. How, uh, how much zoning goes on there? Zero. There you go. You could be in Houston, and you could be driving, going to see Miss Linda to her house, and you stop at her house, and then you just right around the corner, you're now at a, you know, a Walmart. You don't have to see me. <laughs> right? I ain't going but do you see what's the what's the situation here, Miss Linda? What's going on here? Well, in this particular situation, Miss Linda is basically in an unzoned area. Okay, you drive through Houston, you'll see neighborhoods, gas stations, big old fancy restaurants, and then you see these big old office buildings right next to them. It's a big mess. Okay, that's what happens when you don't have zoning. So. There is these adoptions for zoning and planning, okay? And it is the Planning and Zoning Commission, which basically handles these, and they basically make recommendations for zoning ordinances to the city council. So this committee meets, and then this committee makes a recommendation to city council. City council then says, green light, red light, okay? Now, they also are going to have validity of these ordinances in regard to what is going to be required. And that could be the powers that are going to be exercised for a reasonable manner. If there are provisions, they're going to be clear and specific. Again, ordinances can never discriminate, period. Ordinances must promote the public health and safety, and the ordinance must apply to all property similarly. So, could I end up, could I not like Aiden, get on the, these planning and zoning and purposely put crap around Aiden's property? Yeah. I could. I could, but what could Aiden then come back and say I'm doing? Uh, I'm discriminating against him. Okay. You cannot end up in this situation. You cannot have a, a situation where you're creating a planning and zoning area simply for retaliation, okay? They have to basically break down in regards to, in this situation, promoting the public health or promoting the public safety. So in that particular situation is, it's very key that you make certain that you're going through all of these and you understand the purpose behind them, okay? Now, the zoning map amendment, there, these are going to be notifications of property owners within a 200 feet area, okay? Uh, newspaper notice will be in the public hearings, and the public hearings are going to be governing through a body, or the governing body vote. Spot zoning is where there's an amendment different, or basically differing uh, significantly from the area plan, and it's not permitted by courts if only one owner is going to be benefited. That comes back to that situation. It is not going to be permitted if it only benefits one owner. Do you kind of see what I'm saying? Now, there is the conditional use permit, and this basically allows a property use if stipulated conditions have been met. So Mr. Aiden might want to open a gas station on the corner of your property, Mr. Notes. However, the city may say, we'll let you do it, Aiden. However, 
you have to put a like a soundproof wall around that area and you must have you know you must operate between these areas and these times and all of this and if you do all these things then you can build and mr nobles can't say anything okay they have to if you look at a lot of times when you see a gas station in the neighborhood you often notice that there's a fence that perimeters it off the reason being is that that tries to be a barrier between the housing and the commercial part does that make sense now again it must benefit the neighborhood okay if it can't benefit it what happens it ain't working question this might be a stupid question. <clears throat> Should they like enact eminent domain? Like if somebody was going to in a gas station in a certain area, say look, there's not many around right there. Um, Very rarely does eminent domain use a gas station just because the benefit doesn't outweigh the actual cost. Does that kind of make sense? But if there's only one gas station and, and that gas station is 50 plus miles away, could be an argument. Do you see what I'm saying? Because in that situation is they may need that if they're, especially if there's no grocery stores. Sometimes people get there, like my uncle's land, the closest place to him is I think Norman G. Because once you get Norman G, you go out further, you ain't got no, no gas stations, nothing around you. So had there been a spot in that situation, they could, somebody could come in and say, we need a gas station here so that it can provide food to everybody else in that area. You see kind of how that works. A good question though, that is a good question. Uh, again, non-conforming use, okay? What's conforming? We talked about this last night. What's conforming? Conforming is like a uniform. Think of it that way. I could come in and I could say, okay, everybody that works in my office, y'all almost wear slacks and a polo. And your polo and slacks must look like this. We're all what? We're all conforming, right? We're all conforming. We all look the same. So then what happens if Cody comes in dressed the way he is? He has a polo on, but he has, say, jeans. Is he conforming? No, he's non conforming. Okay where you don't conform with everybody else, okay? So it's where building or use no longer conforms to what that zoning is. It's usually permitted to remain until the use or ownership changes. So what this is saying is, is Mr. Eugene, say you live in a neighborhood and everywhere around you is being bought up by businesses. And the last other property next door to you, step and bought it and put an office building there, okay? So you're the last house in that street. Well, it's been zoned what now? Zone commercial. Are you commercial? But can they force you out because it's zone commercial? No. You're grandfathered in. So what happens is everybody else is commercial, but you're still going to be a non-conforming use within a commercial area. Now, as long as you stay in the property, you and your wife own that property, it will stay as a non-conforming use. But the moment you pass or, leave. or sell, what happens, Aiden? It switches over. It automatically switches to commercial. Okay. So the minute that Mr. Eugene decides I'm selling or he dies, then it switches over, and now it is going to be commercial. So in that particular situation is, you have to be careful with that. Now there could be, yes sir. When you sell, do you have to sell commercial or can you sell it zoned, as residential and? Nope. If it is zoned commercial and Mr. Eugene puts it on the market, when he puts it on the market, he has to put it on as commercial, not residential. So, and that's a good thing for you, yeah. truthfully. I actually had a client that was in Houston that everywhere around her got bought up, commercial, commercial, commercial. And the place was, they don't zone, but it's right, basically it was commercial. And she said, I bought my property for $25,000 years ago. And so now she's holding on to it and we get a calculation. That freaking thing's worth close to, I think, half a million dollars now. Jesus. So, yeah. She won't. Why she not? says she's going to die there. And she died. She's in the prime park. She's like prime park in Houston. 
she is in a pre perfect place. I mean, that's like living in downtown Miami and like right on the beach. Like, why would you give that up? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I don't have <laughs> yeah. So in that situation is, is yes, that can occur. But as long as you're there, you get to keep it as long as it is. Even if it's zoned differently, as long as you're there, it's yours. But now does it make the taxes go up or anything? If it's if it's all around you as commercial? You're still uh, you're, in her situation it didn't because she was she had the uh, what do you call homestead. that? The home not homestead, but also old age. She had the old age exemption. So she was locked. But had it been Stefan living there, it would have went up because he drunk it. He's not old age. Now he could have homesteaded it, yeah. but that only locks it to a certain point. So um, again, a variance is basically an exception to a zoning ordinance. Uh, it's basically a waiver. You think of variance, it's a waiver. It's like, say Keith decides he wants to buy next door to you, Mr. Eugene. Right next door there's a house. It's been basically, it used to, when before you moved in, it was an old store, and now that store has just been sitting there, and you move in next door to it, and Keith now wants to buy that, that place, and it's still residential, but Keith wants to make it a store again, okay? Well, if it's zoned residential, Keith could say, I want to ask for a variance and ask the council, can I operate under a variance. Do you see what I'm saying? So it can, it's basically granted when an ordinance would cause an undue hardship to a homeowner. So say for example, that Keith had already bought the property and he just hasn't started on it. And it was it was commercial at the time and then all of a sudden city council comes in and says, now, oh, it's residential. Well, it's put an undue hardship on Keith because what was the purpose of him buying it? To make it commercial. To make it commercial. So in that particular situation, what ends up happening? It basically, in that particular situation, it puts a burden on him. So it would only be fair that Keith gets to do what? That Keith gets to go ahead and operate it like it was supposed to be, okay? Again, they also can, in some situations, that usually the variance is gonna be for the height of a building or a setback. Sometimes you might ask Mr. Eugene, say that you wanna go back to that hypothetical with eight, you want Aiden to build a shed for you, okay? Aiden goes over here and, uh, you know, he's like, you ask Mr. Grossman, he's city council here, and he says, well, no, we're not going to let you do it. We're not even going to let you build it. Well, what you could come back and say is, well, then I want to merge my setback a little bit. Could I, if I bring the building in, can I have about a, just a foot, maybe two feet, just a little bit over? I'm not wanting the whole thing, just one or two feet. Could I, could I build in that situation. And you might be able to get the variance because you've asked for it, okay? But again, it's either high setbacks and same things to that nature. Again, it benefits only one parcel. So you can't do everywhere, it's just one parcel. And the request for a variance is gonna be heard by the Zoning Board of Adjustments, okay? They make the hearings. Now the Zoning Board of Adjustments basically hears the complaints about the effects of zoning ordinances or a specific on a specific property. Uh, the board members must be free of personal or political influence. They have to be basically clear and neutral. And the ZBA decisions can be appealed to the courts. Okay. Now, another one that we want to talk about is the extraterrestrial jurisdiction, the ETJ. Now, I have only dealt with this one time in my entire career, so it doesn't happen much, but it does come up in some situations. And it is where subdivision of land is within one and a half to five miles of a town must be approved, okay? And it's where the purchasers of property outside of a city limits must be given a disclosure that the property might be annexed in the future. So. If you're going to buy a property, Mr. Eugene, and it's within a half to a five mile distance of a town, you're technically in what's called an ETJ. And what that means is, is the city that it's closest to must disclose to you that they might possibly take your land. Not take it, but bring it in within its jurisdiction, which would shoot your taxes up. Yes. Okay. So 
the city must give three years notice prior to annexation though. So they can't just quickly do it. They have to give you some notice. You get three years, but oftentimes once you get that notice, guess what? You now got to disclose it to who? The new buyer. Okay. So the minute you get an ET ETJ, you're pretty much going to be stuck with that land unless somebody wants to come in and buy it. Okay. The city may unilaterally, what you unilaterally mean? Their own decision. They don't give you a choice. Remember, uni, uno, one. The city may unilaterally annex without permission of the persons living in that area. Yeah. Yeah. They may just come on in and just annex all together. Okay. Now, the process for land development is that the initial planning stages have to be done. So in the beginning, the process of land development is, is it breaks it down into what we're going to classify. Okay. The developer would end up finding land, so they have an idea. So say Aiden here has an idea of what he's wanting to build. He wants to build a subdivision. Well, Aiden has came up with an initial plan, but now he's got to find the land. Okay. Once he's found the land, then the subdivision flat will be drawn up by a licensed surveyor. Okay. Now, Mr. Grossman, a surveyor, they're extremely quick, right? Like within five seconds, they have a survey for you, right? Not at all. No. How quick, Aiden? Like, real, real, like, probably within a minute, then? Well, I mean, just on houses, it's around like three weeks to a month. So, for land development. So it's one minute, two, one minute, two months. Yeah. Yeah. Waiting a few weeks. Yeah. What about Miss Knowles? Now, Miss Knowles, peak season, peak season, you definitely can get it done within about a day, right? When peak yeah. season? No. It could be more than a month. Yes. Yeah. When I was going through the very hot market, which was late 2010, we were almost two, two months that it was out. Two months. Right okay. now we're out three months in some areas. Certain areas, but most of the time you're looking at these particular situations is you've got to go in and you have to bring a surveyor in and that's what delays it. Okay. There also will be subdivision regulations because guess what? If you're going to create this land. You also got to get involved the city within your plan. Data. So it's basically initiated by the city planning staff. They're going to tell you the requirements for the streets as well as the lot dimensions, sewers, water mains, utility easements, and areas reserved for public use. See, a lot of people just think, I'm going to go buy 20 acres, and I'm just going to go do whatever I want, and then I'm just going to sell them. No. The city tells you. And by the way, you buy 20 acres, the city may want 10 of it for the streets, the roads, the, the setbacks, and all that. So you only get 10 acres that you actually get to sell. The rest of it, you get to give to the city. Isn't that nice? You get to give it to them. Okay. The final planning stages will also be stated. And once final planning stages have been done, the approval of the final plans and plat will be done by the PNZ or the city council. That plat is then going to be recorded with the county clerk and the city will then issue a permit to the developer. So before you do anything, you have to go through all this stuff. The developer then obtains the final permanent financing and the final budgets are then finally prepared. Marketing programs are also designed within this time frame. So do you see how much work you get to do before you even start the process? It's a lot, it's a lot. Now, there is in some of these situations, I also talk about the disposition or startup stage. What happens is, is that they're going to come in immediately and start working on the streets, the curbs, gutters, utilities, and all those are going to be installed. There will be open areas that are going to be landscaped. The marketing programs are going to be initiated, and the individual lots will then be sold off to builders for home construction. But again, it's a lot of money. A lot of people think, well, I'm going to become a developer. That's what I want to do when we become a developer. Yeah, you can be a developer, but Aiden, we've gone through three slides here, and most of this hasn't even really started on anything. It's all been paperwork. Okay, so it's not a quick process. It's not quick by any means. Okay. No. 
A lot of people think, well, I'm going to become a developer. I'm going to make tons of money. Yeah, but you're going to spend a ton, too. You're going to spend a ton. You may make a lot, but you're going to spend a lot. Okay? Now, ordinances that specify the construction standards are going to be under your building codes. Now, Aiden, as a real estate agent, once you get your license, that automatically makes you a, uh, a, a what do you call that? It, auto it automatically makes you able to tell people code is, code rules, right? You can go around and say, that's not up to code, that's not up to code. You can say that, right? No. No? Who, who says that? Inspectors. No. See, everybody, everybody catches that. Inspectors cannot say code either. They're code enforcement officers. Okay? So not even inspectors can say code. Code enforcement officers are the ones that say the codes. Okay? But again, these codes can also take out of money out of your profit or out of your pocket. Mm -hmm. Mr. Eugene, he thinks, well, I'm gonna build a bathroom, but I'm not gonna put an exterior window. Because that's gonna cost more money for me to put that window in there. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go on and build it straight up. Well, guess what? The building code says there has to be an external way to get out of the property. So guess what? Mr. Eugene has to now do what? He's going to put that window in there. And if he doesn't put it in there, he won't get the certificate of occupancy. So if that situation is, guess what? He can't sell the house. So when you're going through these, these building codes can also take out of your profit. Okay. So they must be met when repairing or erecting buildings. They also set requirements for the kinds of materials, sanitary equipment, electrical wiring, fire prevention standards, and everything else. See, a lot of times a person says, well, I'll become a builder. I'm just going to get into building and do it myself. My response to them all the time when I look at those things is I say, well, what, um, what experience do you got? Because if you think you're just going to jump into building with no experience, good luck. Okay, you have to end up. You have to know your your basically your standards. The building permits that are required before construction or alterations begin, they're basically got to verify the compliance with the building codes and zoning ordinances. Does not if it does not verify compliance with the deed restrictions, you're not getting that permit. And the structures built without permits may have to be dismantled, which is the place, the nice way of saying tear it down, destroy it. Destroy it. Okay. Yeah. And let me tell you, I over my years have met people that they got their real estate license, and they thought, well, I got my real estate license, so I'm going to start building. And they start building a structure and get halfway through it and find out that it didn't meet building code or building permits or whatever they're using. And what ends up happening is I say, you got to tear it down and start from scratch. I got my license. Same thing is a huge costly mistake. Yeah, yeah. it can bankrupt you. Yeah. It can bankrupt you. Now, after a structure is completed, we give what's called a COO, okay? And that's the city inspector issues a certificate of occupancy if they find that it is satisfactory. And let me tell you, they're going to look for every little thing. Okay. Now, private land use controls. There are also, not only just these being the city, okay, building comes from the city level, there's also situations that, that land you bought, Mr. Aiden, you wanted to put a subdivision, or well, your goal was that you wanted to put trailer houses. You wanted to allow people to build either houses or trailer houses. Well, when you bought the land from Mr. Grossman up here, guess what happened? Mr. Grossman put deed restrictions on it. Guess what he said in the deed restrictions? No mobile homes. What? You didn't do your due diligence there. So now you thought, well, I'm going to end up, I'm going to put mobile homes everywhere. <laughs> well, now you got these deed restrictions or restrictive covenants, and now you can't put your mobile home. Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> now, they are placed on property by a developer. So it can be in a deed or separate recorded declaration. There are restrictive use, so the type of building, type of construction, the heights, the setback, size, so all of this stuff can be placed on these properties. 
and it may not restrict the owner's right to sell, mortgage, or convey. You cannot do these, but you can have a bigger impact on what's going to be out there. Okay. There also can be what's called private transfer fees. And this fee is paid to the developer on the sale of the property. They're not permitted, however, after June 15, 2011. Any existing transfer fees must be filed and renewed with the county clerk. If not, they are voided. And the written disclosure must be given to the purchaser. The limited effective term, such as 25 years, may be extended by a majority of the owners. So in most situations, these restrictions could end up falling off after a certain period unless they renew. The validity of a deed is not affected if a restriction is found void, however, by a court. However, if you want to enforce a restriction, you have to ask the JP to give an injunction. Okay. If there's going to be any altering of the deed for the restrictions or the restricted covenances, there are two different methods. They can either be waived, and that's by all owners, mortgage lenders, and the original developers must all agree. So everybody has to come to an agreement, or it has to be through a lawsuit, which is following through the judicial process. Now, in regards to the private land use controls, the conditions is that the deed may be subject to conditions whereby the title may revert to the seller. And as we've talked at the beginning of this class, there are different types of conditions. There are determinable fee estate, fee simple subject to a condition subsequent. Okay. Now, there is also land use control issues. And this oftentimes deals with any type of public ownership. So state ownership is that there is 1% of Texas land is owned by the state and 4% of, of Texas land is owned by the federal government. Also, floodplains, these are oftentimes gonna have a huge impact in regards to property, okay? You had floodplains, what does that mean, Ms. Linda? If a property's in a floodplain, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing because there's a possibility your house flood, also you have to have flood insurance and all. Now, Ms. Linda, real quick question. What if Mr. Grossman bought a property and just the size of my foot here, if only my foot was just at the very, very back end of his property, just my foot was the size of the floodplain, just, just that little bitty area is in his property that he's buying. He don't need flood insurance, right? Yes, he will. Why would he need flood insurance? Because it's, it can... As There's potential for what? A flooding. For flooding. Even though if Mr. Grossman's house is at the very front of the property and it's five acres away from that one little foot of mine in the back, there's still potential that his property could flood. So in that situation, Mr. Grossman now just has to pay what? Flood insurance. Flood insurance. And is that cheap, Mr. Nobles? No. No, not at all. Are y'all paying over y'all Nope. No, we're not in, we are not considered in a flood plain. I had a client that actually ran into that where it's only one foot, no, no lie, the size of my foot was in the floodplain. And she had to pay $250 a month for flood, plain, for oh, flood insurance. Yeah. That ain't cheap at all. Mm -hmm. No. That's why we, and it never goes away. That's why when you buy pay off your, your house is still paying for the insurance. Right. Uh -huh. Interstate Land Sales Full Disclosure Act. Sometimes, there can be land sales amongst other states. There are certain rules that if there are sales amongst other states, they have to be disclosed. The environmental protection, the Texas environmental concerns. There are certain things that are of concern to the, the EPA, of, uh, not only just from the federal level, but from the state level. Things such as ozone non-attainment, impaired water bodies, water supplies, toxic release inventory, Superfund sites, wetlands, and endangered and threatened species, all are some of the environmental issues and concerns that the state of Texas has. 
So do not be aware or do not be surprised that while you're selling real estate, that you may not at one point run into this issue. Okay. A lot of times is, is people ask, well, when do I need to use this? Well, whose responsibility is it to disclose this stuff? It's the seller. The seller's the one that's supposed to disclose this. Okay. But should the buyer also do their due diligence? Yes. Okay. If there is any disclosure or discovery of hazardous matters, we need to make certain that we provide the proper notices and disclosures. So for example, the seller's disclosure of property condition, is that important, Aiden? Yes. Why is the seller's disclosure important? Uh, it saves them from being sued. Uh, it limits, yeah, it limits their liability. Okay. Now what if Miss Linda, she doesn't want, you know, anybody to know about her termite. She's, you know, she don't want to tell nobody about that. Is that is that okay, Miss Linda? No. Why? Because you need to disclose that. What happens if Miss Linda doesn't disclose it, Aiden? Uh, they can come back and sue her for three times the damages. They can come back and sue her. And if it's deceptive, they can sue for three times. What about lead-based paint? That's not important, is it, Stephanie? Lead-based paint? Uh, it was before 19... Yeah, it was before 1978. You can die from it. So there's a disclosure for that. I don't think they make it anymore, do they? Nope. No. What about, Miss Linda, do you really care, say you bought your house, do you care if um, if Aiden had owned it before you and, and he put a some toxic waste underneath your house? You don't care about that, do you? Yes. Why do you care about that? Because that stuff can come up off the ground into the walls or into the, into, uh, the structure. structure of the home. Yeah. So in that situation, what ends up happening? You can cause issues. You go next door and turn into Superman. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Again, there are also environmental assessment addendums, and the persons that also oftentimes are involved in these hazards, of course, are going to be your inspectors, consultants, or even remediators. Okay. Again, environmental auditors can also be used, and there sometimes are different phases in regards to site assessments. But again, understand that there are a lot of things that can potentially happen when dealing with real estate. Now, there also is the environmental responsibility and liability. Okay, The CERCLA -E is to identify responsible parties and order any clean and cleanup actions. The landowner may be liable for cleanup regardless of who created the contamination and innocent landowner does have immunity. So basically, Miss Linda, you know, you have anybody in your family that uh, that is a hoarder? Oh, I have plenty of them. Plenty of them. Yeah. How about you, Aiden? You got any family members or friends that are have have a hoarding issue? I do. What about you, Stephen? Uh, well, yeah, my sister. So. <laughs> So in, these very clean, that's for sure. so in these situations, could let, let's just play this out. Say, Mr. Eugene, that uh, that you were a hoarder. What happens, Miss Linda, if Mr. Eugene decides one day, yeah, you know, I got this old truck and I'm just going to set it in the backyard. I'm just going to pull it in the backyard. I don't drive it no more. I'm just going to park it back there. I'm just going to let it sit. What happens, Miss Linda, to that over time? Can it cause contamination? Yes, because you bring in varmints like rats and roaches and snakes. What about if it had gas in the gas tank? It could leak into the ground. What if you have a septic system and, and it leaks in the ground? What could happen? It can do that. Could uh could it get any could it get in your water? Yes. Could it contaminate not just your house but many other ones? Yes. See a problem here? So again, in these situations, we have to make certain that as we're going through this, we're getting this taken care of. The innocent land owner immunity is that a landowner who was completely innocent should not be held liable. They must have no actual or constructive knowledge of the damage. They must have had a phase one site assessment before they purchased. 
and they must not be environmentally damaged. The, the screen right on there. Must not be environmentally damaged. Okay. Now, of course, real estate professionals are responsible for the discovery and disclosure. It is your duty not to do this. You do not go out to a house, for example, say you go out to Mr. Noble's house to go over and intentionally sell it. So you walk out to Mr. Noble's house and you're going along and you're walking around and you, you notice there's, a, there's an old truck it's just been sitting there, looks like it's been abandoned. You start walking around some more, you see some gas tanks that look like they've been rusted. And there's a bunch of, it's like real soggy around that area. And you start walking around, you see a bunch of like iron that's just been rusted and it's, it just, it's bad, okay? When you give Mr. Nobles the seller's disclosure, do you need to go over there and, and should you tell Mr. Nobles he needs to disclose that, or do you just ignore it and just move on? I'd advise him to write it down. Why would you advise him to do that? <clears throat> it's always better safe than sorry. Exactly. It's always better to put that stuff down because he is responsible, and you are responsible, to make certain it is disclosed. Now, what if Mr. Nobles tells you, don't you dare say nothing about this? I had contamination and all, and, but I don't want you telling nobody because that's going to ruin my chances of selling the land. What do you do? I say, that. I mean, that's fine, but I want it in writing that you don't want to put it down. Well, I'm not going to put it right. Uh, do you take the listing? No, I'll probably drop it. Yeah, because what happens? Who's responsible? Mm -hmm. You. You're the expert. Me. Yeah. Also, appraisers, lenders, and property and mortgage insurance companies all need to be aware of these things. Here are some examples of the, and I've always loved this, this hypothetical here. These are actually things that people don't think about on this chart right here. They don't think about these. They don't think about underground storage tanks. Sometimes, like Mr. Eugene, you said earlier, and Miss Linda, I know for a fact, you've told me this before, that, oh, where all those houses are built, they used to be a gas station. Well, are we 100% certain they pulled these storage tanks up? They were filled with gas. Do we not know if there isn't in some situation what we call radon, the radon gases that come up? Another thing is, could you not get carbon monoxide from your own water heater? Yes. Okay. Again, the sides of the house, you see the lead-based paint. Look over here with this uh, transformer, the, these uh, electric lines. Guess what? That's electron, electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation that can come off those. Okay? There's a lot of things, just like the asbestos. There can be asbestos in a house. There's a lot of things people don't think about when they're purchasing a house. Okay? It's your duty as a real estate professor or professional to do what? to advise them, okay? So what is going green? Well, it is a philosophy, or basically a, not only just a philosophy, philosophy so. but it's also a, a social movement, okay? It's basically centered on the concern of the conservation and improvement of our natural resources. Green building programs are basically designed to reduce the impact of buildings on health and hu or human health and the environment. We want to have efficient use of our energy, our water, and other resources. We also want to protect the occupant's health in improving the employee's productivity and also reduce the waste pollution and environmental degradation. Ms. Linda, what's Energy Star? That is appliances that help you save energy. That's like from, you can buy appliances, washing machine and dryers, you can buy ice box freezers, <clears throat> anything, but it has a label, but they, it is created to save energy. So the point is, is if you buy that particular product, does it mean that it's supposed to save you some money? Yes. So ultimately, when it comes into this situation is these green building certifications, 
basically mean that this, pro this product is going to be beneficial and save money and not have waste of usage. Yes. Also, sometimes having energy efficient appliance, it also helps you as far as when it comes to selling your home as well. And also sometimes you can get tax uh, credit as well. Exactly. Exactly. The energy efficient mortgage, there are new homes that are built to what's called the Energy Star or similar efficiency, uh, energy efficient standards. Uh, and by doing that, you can get a EEM mortgage, okay, which is a good thing. You can get an energy improvement mortgage, which includes funds for those energy efficient improvements to an existing home. There are also tax incentives. In Texas, the ad valorem property tax exemptions for the value of a renewable green energy improvements can be benefited. Incentive for programs for improving your energy efficiency, such as the Austin Green, Austin Energy's Green Building Program. The federal government also has the Residential Energy Efficiency Tax Credit, and it's available periodically for energy efficient water heaters, doors, windows, and insulation. There's also the Residential and Renewable Energy Tax Credit, up to 30% of qualified expenditures for the system serving a resident, and that was until December 31st of 2016. The remediation programs, Texas does have the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, the uh, green or the clean energy and the offshore carbon dioxide storage. The United States government also deals with waste disposal, zero net energy buildings and green buildings certifications with those energy stars. So everyday green living, basically what are suggestions and ideas? Well, some of the basic ones are what? Well, when you brush your teeth, should you leave your water running while you're brushing your teeth? Nope. No, you're wasting water. What about Miss Linda, if, uh, if Aiden is at his house and he wants to he wants to make him a sandwich. Should he just leave his ice box wide open while he makes a sandwich? No. Why not? Wasting He's wasting energy. What if Aiden goes around and leaves all the lights on in his house? Is that okay? Aiden? Waste of energy. Waste of energy. <laughs> things <laughs> right there. things of that situation is it's wasteful use. Okay. Water. Again, there is the real estate professional or the NAR green designation, and you can become the expert in your community by learning different ways to be green in your particular area. All right, so tonight we ended up, we have completed our lecture for this evening, okay? Now, tomorrow, tomorrow, geez, no, tomorrow. our next lecture, I am going to no, we're not, tomorrow. no, no, none of that, scratch that. Our next lecture is actually one of my fun ones. I know tonight this one's kind of more of a, a, a dragging one, but this next one that we're actually gonna go into talks about the business of many different specializations. I enjoy this one simply because of the fact of the matter is, is it does, it deals with a lot of different types of specializations, talks about a lot in regards to what you can do with a real estate license. And sometimes you don't even have to have a real estate license. You can do other things that do not require to actually have that license. So with that being said, we are going to go in. We're going to, uh, again, start in on Monday. Uh, we will get through this one, through this slide. And then after that, we'll pick back up uh, and then we'll keep moving along. But again, we are, we're almost done. Be happy. Look at that. Look at that number real quick. There's only, that, we don't hold on, no, but here's a good thing. There's only how many units, Mr. Grossman? 22. 22. And look at that number right there. We're real close, okay? We're real close to completing our lectures. So we should be done in a few, basically five more days, five more lectures, I believe, and we should be done, okay? Ooh. And then we will be finished. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and call this a mic.